Good afternoon. Today we are moving out of the culture dish into hosts. So everything we've done so far, pretty much replication in cells and culture to establish the basic principles of virus replication. Now we talk about infection of hosts, among them people, but other hosts as well. So we're going to talk about how viruses cause disease. And this is part of the part three of the strategy that I told you about in the first session, how viruses establish themselves in populations. The first, of course, was that the virus packages the, the genome and the genome encodes everything it needs to make more viruses. Part three, a viral genome has to establish itself in a population. Of course, if a virus just infects tissue culture cells, that won't do it very much good. It has to exist in nature as well. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. So every host that, that's alive today, all of you and every other animal that is infected by viruses has to have immune defenses to deal with the infections, not just viruses, of course, but other pathogens, as well as tumors that arise in you that have to be cleared by our immune response. And on the other hand, viruses have to counter that. If a virus can't counter an immune response, it will be eliminated. And we have learned about these in the last 10 or 20 years, and they're really amazing. We'll go through some of them. And this interplay between virus and host, it's always changing. Some people have called it an arms race. The virus overcomes a host defense by mutating something, then the host overcomes it, and you can actually track these throughout uh, phylogenetic history. And that's what we're going to be looking at in the next series of lectures. And there are viruses all around us, as I told you in the very beginning. We live in a cloud of viruses, but most of the infections that happen have no consequence at all. Many infections are what we call asymptomatic um, because maybe uh, the viruses replicate, but they don't do the right number of things to cause any disease. Of course, many infections never really begin if viruses land on your skin, as you will see. They don't initiate infection. The virus particles are destroyed or they don't replicate uh, very much. And then there are the asymptomatic or inapparent infections. Those are two terms we'll use for the same thing. Yes? Uh, it says that uh, most infections have no consequence and that most of them land on like, things like skin. So right. what is the exact definition of infection in this case if the virus never <laughs> actually gets into a cell? So in this case, if it never gets in a cell, there's no infection. Here it may infect one or two cells, and that's an infection of those cells. But if you're talking about the organism, then we, we will define an infection as an antibody response or some kind of an immune response to infection for our purposes. And that's why we say many infections are inapparent. We measure these by measuring an antibody response. There are no symptoms, but immune defenses are activated. And that's how we know there are asymptomatic infections because we measure antibodies in people and we see, oh, they have antibodies to Ebola, but they're still living. How can that be? Um, so we use immune responses as a measure. So these are in apparent infections, and we'll talk a lot about those. The virus replicates, it spreads within you, but you're fine. And uh, that's probably the large majority of infections. When you get sick, it's probably an accident or some miscommunication of some kind. So an example is West Nile virus infection. This is a flavivirus spread by Culex mosquitoes, shown here. Remember, these are positive strand RNA viruses with envelopes, with glycoproteins, and so forth. Uh, this wasn't in the US before 1999. It was first discovered in Africa and was, is prevalent in that area. But 1999, it came to the US. Does anybody know where it made landfall in the US? Queens. Queens. Very interesting story. It was a hot summer. For some reason, it took off. Um, and it's spread in less than four years across the entire country. Started here in Queens, it's now everywhere in the US, it's in Mexico, it's in Canada, it's made its way up to Alaska as well. And in those four years, a million people were infected. We measured antibodies. We we're interested in seeing how this virus was spreading. It was a new introduction, so there was a lot of surveillance. 20% of the people got fever, but of course, if you didn't have a diagnostic, you wouldn't know what the fever was from. And 1% uh, of the people got neuroinvasive illness. The virus went into the CNS and called encephalitis. So a lot of people got infected, but there's no obvious disease. 
Uh, this is a problem, of course, if there's no obvious disease and you give blood, you can transmit the infection to someone else. So you have to check the blood supply for this virus now. Uh, and then in an epidemic, if there were a huge outbreak, you'd have a problem because unless you sample everyone and look for virus or antibodies, you're going to have trouble stopping the infection. This is a very common problem with inapparent infections uh, that we can't detect them quickly enough. So we are pretty good at understanding a lot of aspects of infection and detection now, but it wasn't always the case. So let's just go back a ways and, and talk a little bit about how our understanding evolved. For many, many thousands of years, we had no clue what made people sick in any way. And there, it was known that people got sick spontaneously, uh, and some of them got better, some of them would die. And this was attributed to poisonous air. So influenza is named after an influence of, of something. They didn't know what it was. It's an old name. It goes back many, many years. Only in the late 1800s, uh, Robert Koch, the German physician, made the association between bacteria and disease. So remember, not too long before, Louis Pasteur had said there are microorganisms. They multiply. They don't spontaneously generate. Koch said they can cause disease. And he established these so-called Koch's postulates which you have to fulfill in order to prove that a certain agent causes a disease. So he came up with the name pathogen, which we're going to use all the time now, although maybe it's really only correct when the viruses make you sick, so, and most of the time they don't. Now, one of the, the first human virus identified was yellow fever virus. Yellow fever was known as a disease for many, many years. And it was a terrible disease. It was highly lethal. It prevented colonization of many places. Um, and it was generally a scourge. And it was in many, many places, including in as far north as Boston uh, in the US. Uh, 1901, the, first, it was, the virus was identified. And this was done by taking serum from a sick person. Yellow fever was so called because you got yellow. You got jaundice because the, the disease involves your liver. And so it was, they, would, they took some serum from an infected person. They filtered it through a filter and showed that a virus was present. And they, in fact, infected another person with that serum. Back then, you could do these kinds of experiments. Now, um, this is a famous painting showing one of the, one of the incidents in yellow fever history. Uh, Carlos Finlay, this gentleman here, he was a physician in Cuba. So Cuba had a yellow fever problem. And in the 1800s, about 1880, he said, looks like it's transmitted by a mosquito. He, he did some epidemiology, and he sorted that out. And then there was a large uh, US military presence in Cuba, and they were get, the, the troops would get sick from yellow fever. So uh, Walter Reed was a member of the US military. You may recognize the name, Walter Reed Army Hospital down in the DC area is named after him. Uh, I believe that's him here. He went to Cuba and tried to sort out what was going on, and he showed that it was a virus and that it was transmitted by mosquitoes. And one of his helpers was Jesse Lazier, and he is shown here uh, putting a tube full of mosquitoes on a volunteer's arm. So they did human-to-human -human transmission experiments, and a lot of these volunteers died. In fact, Lazier himself volunteered to get bitten by a mosquito, and he died. Um, there's a very famous nurse from New, Jer New Jersey, Clara Moss, if you go down the New Jersey Turnpike, one of the rest stops is named after her. And she participated, in, I think she was in Cuba, she participated in one of these experiments and she died as well. So that's the story of yellow fever, 1901, the first human virus and transmitted by a mosquito. Now, uh, for the rest of the course, we're going to talk about viral pathogenesis, how a virus causes disease in a host. And there are many questions we'll look at in many different ways. How the, get, how the virus gets in the host? What does the host do in response? Where does the virus replicate? How does it spread in the host? What tissues it replicates in? Is it a quick infection, an acute infection, or is it chronic or latent or long-term? And then how, how do we transmit it to other hosts? And these are all the kinds of questions that we look at when we study pathogenesis. Now, a few, I, a few thoughts on the very early stages. How do you start an infection? How do you become infected with a virus? You need to have enough particles. If you have two particles, you're not likely to get infected. You probably have to have more, and how many uh, varies per virus. Uh, wherever the virus lands, the cells have to be 
accessible, susceptible, and permissive. You know what those terms all mean now. They have to have receptors, and the cells have to be internally uh, permissive for infection. And then your defense systems have to be either not present or defective, or they, they have to be overcome by infection. All right, so there are a lot of things that have to happen for a successful infection. And as I said, how many viruses does it need is, are required to infect you? This varies uh, per host. We really can't do these experiments in people for the most part. We can do them with benign viruses. We can do them with rhinoviruses that cause common colds. We can do human volunteer experiments even today. We can do volunteer experiments with neuroviruses, which cause gastroenteritis. But with most other viruses, we cannot. And many variables uh, play into this issue of how many virions it takes, uh, the genetics of whatever the host might be, uh, the defenses, the virulence of the particular virus, which can vary the social behavior of the hosts, age, weather, environment. A lot of things that are fuzzy. We can't really quantify them, but they all play into this issue. Now, viruses don't have an easy time moving around. You know, this room is full of them, but most of them are going to be inactivated or, or dried out. Uh, viruses are sensitive to the environment, heat, drying, UV, light when it's sunny out. And that's why viruses, for one reason, make a lot of particles, because they have to overcome this uh, environmental problem. Uh, once they get in, an individual, they're sensitive to low pH or proteases that, that, that are found in the intestinal tract. So many viruses do not survive a trip through the intestinal tract. And as you'll see in a few moments, a lot of our viruses are put there. So viruses that can make gastrointestinal infections have to be evolved to be resistant to these conditions. Other ways to get around these issues, some viruses uh, don't experience the environment. So you have a virus that, like yellow fever that uh, replicates in you, and a, a mosquito picks it up from your blood and carries it to another individual. So that virus is never subject to UV light or desiccation. Gets around that by using an insect vector. And then, of course, uh, many infections are spread by physical contact. You shake someone's hand and you give them a virus, or you, you're speaking close to them and you're emitting uh, aerosols which have viruses in them. So uh, you, that virus doesn't have a lot of chance of being inactivated. So many ways to get around this, this hostile environment. So today we're going to talk about some general concepts in pathogenesis, um, which again, as I said, is the process of making disease. And there are two major components here. It's not just the virus. Of course, it is what the virus does, where it replicates, and how much it replicates, and how it kills cells or doesn't. That's a large component of the pathogenesis, but also what the host does how the host responds. And as you will see, for some viruses, all the disease that you show is your immune response responding to the infection. So you may have this idea that viruses are at fault for everything. They make you sick. All of your symptoms are viral. But in fact, it's your immune response. And there are many cases where if we could in inhibit an immune response, we might be better off. And the infections that we will talk about are, as I said, benign or inapparent or very mild to lethal infections. So viruses span the gamut of all of those possibilities. And then and we'll talk about the basis for some of that. And then we will talk about the fact that some infections are very quick. We call those acute infections. They can be just a few days in length or they can be persistent. They can, have, they can occur over the course of years, up to 10 years for AIDS, for example, uh, of infection. So it's very quick to very slow. So the first step is gaining access to you or whatever animal is being infected. And there are limited sites that can be infected. If you think of your bodies as pretty complicated, uh, but in fact, there are not many ways that viruses can get in. And you can see they're all here. We have our skin, uh, we have various mucosal surfaces, the conjunctiva, the respiratory and alimentary, and urogenital tracts. And those are really the main ways uh, that viruses can get into us. So let's start with the skin. Your biggest organ, about five kilograms. Uh, it's a very good barrier to infection because not only is the outer layer dead, so the, the skin is composed of many layers, as you can see here. Uh, the epidermis, 
The uppermost layer of the epidermis, the stratum corneum, is mainly dead cells. These, of course, are sloughed off all the time, and the, the cells below move up. So the outer layer, if a virus lands on your skin, you have unbroken skin, it's not going to replicate because the cells are dead. So that's a really good barrier for infection. In addition, we, of course, have resident bacteria on our skin. No matter how much you use soap or alcohol-based cleansers, you have a nice microbiome which should be there, and one of its functions is to make uh, antivirals. It makes compounds that prevent viruses from colonizing. It's not just your skin, but many other parts of our body as well. So these are commensal microorganisms uh, that make inhibitors. They also keep the pH low, so it's a good barrier for infection. Of course, if you have a break in the skin, if you have a cut, a virus could get in could then get into the sub-epithelial uh, layers. The epidermis, the lower layers, are living cells, but there's not much vascularization there. There's no blood vessels to take away uh, the viruses, so that is not a, a great place to replicate. Many infections stay localized there, but below it are the sub-epithelial tissues. They're full of blood vessels and lymph glands. So if a virus can get down there, it can replicate and spread. You can get there by breaks in your skin, by insect bites, of course, by animal bites, dog bites or raccoon bites will deliver viruses through your skin, needle punctures that happen in a hospital. So the skin can be breached, obviously, but on its own, it's a good barrier. Now, the mucosal surfaces are ripe for infection because they are designed to exchange material. Right? They take, you have to take in uh, nutrients and air, and you have to excrete things. So the mucosal surface is just bare cells. It has, a mu it has mucus on it, which, as you will see, is protective. Bare cells, it's moist. It's a perfect place for viruses to uh, be introduced into. So this doesn't really have a lot of natural defense. It has a few, but it, has, it depends on other kinds of defenses for um, protection. Very much, not like the skin, where just being dead, having a dead layer of, of skin is a very good defense. So that's the respiratory tract. Well, the respiratory tract we'll, th we'll consider first, but there are others as well. And this is a um, close-up of the respiratory tract and the cells that compose it. So the respiratory tract is a great place for viruses to come in. It's the most common way that viruses infect us by the respiratory tract. You breathe about six liters of air a minute, so you're always sampling the atmosphere and whatever viruses are in it. The area is huge. It's something like 140 square meters of, air, of area in your lungs. You have 300 million alveoli, so plenty of opportunity uh, for viruses to infect. And we, of course, have an upper tract, uh, a trachea, which is then linked to the lower tract, the bronchi, the bronchioles, and the alveoli. And viruses can replicate at every level of the tract. Uh, they, they can replicate mainly in the upper tract, and, and they cause clinical manifestations, which are listed here. For example, rhinitis is a common cold. It's a virus replicating mainly in your upper tract. Pharyngitis, laryngitis, also upper tract uh, infections. You can see the viruses that can do that here. And then some can move into the trachea. Influenza typically goes down into the trachea. This is why you feel lousy. Uh, you have uh, pain in your tracheal region because the virus is going down there. And then if it gets down into the bronchi and the, bron and the alveoli, then you get pneumonia and you have even more serious problems. But viruses, as you can see, can get all the way down there. Now the tract is lined with an epithelial layer shown here. Uh, here are the, the typical ciliated epithelial cells lining the tract. And there is a layer of mucus on them, which is a protective layer, as you will see. Uh, and that's produced by goblet cells. There, are also, there is also a structure beneath the uh, epithelial layer. It's called the basement membrane. And that provides sort of a barrier for pathogens to get through, as you will see. But this is pretty much what viruses see what they, when they enter the tract. And many viruses like to replicate uh, in these cells. So when you inhale uh, virus-laden droplets, this is where they like to go. So the, because this respiratory tract is so vulnerable, we have pretty good defenses, at least in healthy people. If you're not healthy or if you smoke, you're going to ruin most of these defenses. Okay? So a good one is mucus. Make a lot of mucus a day, 20 to 200 mils per day in your nose and lungs. You're all doing this 
unless you're not drinking much water and then you make less because you're dried out. But that's really important. This mucus is always moving uh, a centimeter a minute. There is a mucociliary escalator that takes stuff from your lungs and moves it up and then you swallow it. Same thing from the upper tract. Viruses or any particles that lodge in the back of your throat they get, uh, or your pharynx, they get moved to the throat where you can then swallow them. So you have this, this escalator. So these are the cilia on top of the cells that are moving the mucus up. The mucus traps particles, including viruses. And as I said, you swallow them, and if they are respiratory pathogens, you will inactivate them in your stomach because you have low pH and all of that. Sinuses also filter particles, yes? Couldn't a virus that, that used normally infects the stomach or can it deal with low pH take advantage of this? Yes, actually. So some, some excuse me, gastroenteritis viruses are spread by aerosol. When you vomit, you make an aerosol of viruses. And this is what happens on airplanes often. You'll have one person who has gastroenteritis caused by norovirus, and they vomit in their bag. But that makes an aerosol that circulates throughout the whole plane because the, the air system takes in the virus. And it's been shown, there have been studies on planes, 75% uh, of the people will get infected from one person doing that. Yes, you inhale it, and then you swallow it, and that's how it gets into your uh, gut tract. So those, st those studies have been done. So everybody gets infected. Then the, the flight crew goes to another plane, and they're infected, and they infect everyone on the next plane. It's a real problem. Fortunately, it's over in a couple of days. Just a few days of vomiting and diarrhea. It's not so bad. OK, so our respiratory tract also has uh, immune cells and antibodies to help protect it well, in addition to the mucus. OK, so the respiratory tract, the number one entry point, um, the alimentary, but I, I, before I go on, I should say that that's not the main way that you would get these gastroenteritis viruses. You would also get them by ingesting contaminated food, uh, touching contaminated surfaces, and so forth. But it can get in by this route as well. Alimentary tract is another good way for viruses to get in because you are eating stuff all the time. You eat contaminated food. And all of us touch our face many, many times an hour. And if you have contaminated fingers, you will introduce viruses. People bite their fingers and introduce stuff into their mouth all the time. So alimentary tract is great for that. And of course, whatever you put in your mouth, it brings it down into the alimentary tract. And the alimentary tract is designed to digest food, of course, so it's always mixing. So viruses have an easy time to contact the wall, which is what they have to do to find a susceptible cell. And so, as I said before, viruses have evolved to be resistant to the acid and, and basic conditions and the enzymes and so forth uh, that are present there in the alimentary tract. This is also lined with epithelial cells. Here's a cross-section of uh, one part of the gut. Here's the lumen or the interior portion. It's lined with villi, of course, which are composed of epithelial cells. And below the epithelial sheet are, again, the subepithelial tissues. Uh, in, the, in, in the case of the intestines, we have some muscle cells as well, but viruses can breach uh, across these, as you will see. Here's a, an expansion of this region. Again, the, the epithelium, which are called enterocytes in the intestines. There are also uh, cells interspersed among these, which are called M cells. And these are cells who are, that are designed to sample the contents of the gut to make sure there are no uh, inappropriate antigens there. So these are cells that are uh, very thin so that material can be brought in by transcytosis. And they also have immune cells below them. So here you can see uh, lymphocytes and macrophages below the M cell. And they're there to take up the material that's transcytosed and so they can check it out, um, bring it to a T cell, and make sure it's not self or something like that. They basically scan the intestinal content. So again, the, the digestive tract is a good place for viruses to enter. Urogenital tract is another one. This is protected by low pH and mucus. Uh, but sexual activity will introduce abrasions that allow viruses to get into here as well. For example, the papillomaviruses that cause genital warts are introduced in this way. These kinds of viruses typically stay localized, but there are other viruses that infect uh, the urogenital tract that initially 
uh, replicate there and then move somewhere else, like herpes viruses or even HIV. So it's another portal of entry. And the eye is another one. The eye, of course, is um, exposed. Our, we have a layer of cells covering it. It, it does have good defenses because we blink a few times um, every second, in, in fact. Uh, and that blinking has its function. We have fluid in our eyes, and the blinking washes any grit that has landed on our eye, and it pushes it down below. And so this is very good at protecting the eye. And usually when you get an eye, a virus infection in the eye, it's because you have a little grit in your eye, and you rub it, and you scratch the cell layer, and that makes an opening that viruses can get into. Uh, you go to the eye doctor and his or her instruments, you know, sometimes they put them right on your eye to do things. And if they're not properly sanitized, it can spread viruses from one person to another. And then swimming in pools or hot tubs that don't have the right amount of chlorine in them to inactivate all the viruses is a very common source of eye infections. And so the viruses, we're going to talk about some specific examples uh, later on. Viruses can replicate in the conjunctival membranes. So that's the very outer layer, this very thin layer of cells. Uh, you can see it right here covering the lens, the cornea, the cornea. And again, you can scratch that via grit and introduce viruses. Uh, viruses can also replicate um, in the sclera, which is this thicker layer covering the outside of the eyeball, uh, as well as the cornea, we'll see later. And when viruses infect the conjunctival layer, they often induce this bleeding shown here. It's a very typical conjunctivitis caused by a number of viruses, including adenoviruses. You get this very scary looking red eye, but it resolves itself rather quickly. All right, so those are the main routes of entry into the host. This is a summary, basically, of all of that. You can see uh, ways virus get into the host. We've talked about all these, respiratory, alimentary, urogenital, eyes, and skin. Uh, and these are the viruses that can go in. You see there's some overlap. Uh, some viruses can get into many different parts of the respiratory tract. But notice the alimentary tract infections, the viruses that cause these are, are in general different, except for like adenoviruses can do both. And these are specific serotypes that either infect the respiratory tract uh, or the GI tract. Yeah. It would, yeah, theoretically, but it turns out that the viruses that are transmitted by insect vectors are very specific, and they have to be able to be transported in them. So, you know, hepatitis C, uh, the herpes viruses, uh, HIV, they don't get transmitted in insects. They probably can't propagate in them. Dr. Silverstein? Yeah, but none of these viruses can be transmitted in vectors, too. They, you know. All right. Uh, so we've got viruses into us. These are the main, way, main ways that viruses get in. Next step, they have to go somewhere. Well, it turns out that not every virus spreads from where it comes in. There are some localized infections. So some viruses can remain localized. We call that a localized infection. So let's say this is our respiratory epithelium. Uh, a virus has come in here and managed to infect one of these cells. Uh, this cell produces virus, and then the virus just spreads along the epithelium. So this is the basement membrane is a pretty good barrier to virus getting below it. So many viruses are just contained, and they go along the, bar the epithelium. Rhinoviruses do this and remain contained. They don't get into your systemic circulation and go somewhere else. All right. So many viruses are, are restricted. Rhinoviruses, influenza viruses, they're all restricted to your respiratory epithelium. Other kinds of viruses get disseminated, which means simply they spread beyond the primary site of infection. So the primary site is where the virus comes into you and multiplies in those initial cells, if they're epithelial cells of the respiratory epithelium. If they spread from that primary site, they, we call them disseminated. And some viruses then go on and pick a particular uh, organ in which to replicate in. Some replicate in many organs, and we call that systemic. Many organs infected is a systemic infection. Now, in order for an infection to spread beyond the primary site, we have to breach 
both immune and physical barriers. So there's a very good immune system here, plus there's a physical barrier, this basement membrane. So how do you do that? So we have, uh, as, we, as I told you in the gut, there are these M cells that uh, line the gut. They're interspersed among the uh, enterocytes, and their function is to sample the lumen of the, of the gut. Uh, and below them are, are immune cells. And these immune cells are very good at traversing the basement membrane. They can fit in between. And so they're very good at carrying viruses out, for example. So many viruses can get in through an M cell, get taken up uh, by a lymphocyte or a macrophage, and then they bring you into the circulation. Other viruses, when they infect these uh, enterocytes or respiratory epithelial cells, they cause, they cause inflammation. And that is, it causes an immune response. Various immune cells come into the infected area. They secrete chemical mediators that uh, have a variety of functions, including causing vascular permeability so that we can get better antigen sampling, but they also break down the basement membrane. So the immune response causes inflammation, and inflammation ends up in breaking down this membrane, and then viruses can pass through it. Okay, so you can see already that our response to infection is helping the virus to spread because it's making things more permeable. It's making the, the blood vessels permeable. It's making the basement membrane uh, more permeable as well. So viral spread depends on these factors, immune cells taking virus away, inflammation. It also depends on where the virus is released from the infected cell. Remember now, these are polarized cells. They have distinct apical basal lateral domains. That means they're chemically different. And virus, some viruses can be released from one or the other side or both. And this can have an effect on whether an infection remains local or spreads systemically. So here's an example of this. So here are three polarized epithelial cell cultures infected with three different viruses, influenza viruses at the top. And this virus is released from the apical domain of polarized cells, not from the basal lateral domain. Second panel is measles virus, again, only released from the apical domain. So these are respiratory pathogens that remain, um, well, influenza virus remains localized to the respiratory tract. Measles does not, but we'll get to that in a later uh, talk. Uh, this one is vesicular stomatitis virus. And this one is released at the basolateral side of epithelial cells. So influenza is released apically. It, re it remains in the, intestine, in the uh, respiratory tract. VSV uh, becomes a systemic infection because it's released below the sheet and can get into the circulation. It turns out that measles is actually brought into your systemic circulation by immune cells that are present in the respiratory lumen. We'll, we'll talk about that later. But if it were just dependent on the production of virus at the apical side, measles would remain in, in the uh, respiratory tract. Now, to illustrate the effect of um, this polarized release, I'm going to think about a virus called Sendai virus. It's related to measles. It's a paramyxovirus. And this typically... Uh, this virus is released from the apical side of respiratory epithelial cells. You can infect mice with this virus. Uh, it remains in the respiratory tract because it's apically released. A number of years ago, virologists made a mutant of this virus that could now be released from both sides of the cells, both apical and basolateral domains. And when you infect mice with this virus, that virus gets into the circulation and causes a systemic infection. It infects many organs. So just by virtue of being released at the basal lateral side of these cells allows the virus to get into the circulation. Otherwise, it would be restricted to the respiratory tract. So it's a very powerful determinant of whether a virus can spread or not. So once a virus is below that magical basement membrane, once it gets below the epithelial sheet, it now can go anywhere it wants because below the epithelium are the subepithelial tissues, which are vascularized and have lymph capillaries. And the virus can get into these. So here's a lymph node uh, with some lymphatic capillaries. Lymphatic capillaries are pretty permeable because their job is to take up tissue fluids and circulate it, bring it into the circulatory system. So they're quite permeable. Viruses can get into them. And of course, once you're in a lymph capillary, eventually you make it to the general circulation, because as you know, they are connected. 
So viruses can get into lymph capillaries. They can also get into circulatory capillaries as well uh, and make it into the circulation. And we call this hematogenous spread, the presence of virus in the blood, and the virus can go anywhere. Once in the blood, within a few minutes, you are in any tissue of your choice. So the presence of virus in the blood is also called viremia, and this is a very important um, aspect of many viral infections. And this is just a graph that uh, illustrates a viremia. So what we've done here is to take an experimental animal, inject some uh, virus into the blood of this animal. You can do intravenous injection. Uh, and then at different days after infection, you measure the amount of virus in the blood. You could take some blood samples and do a virus titer, plaque, plaque, uh, plaque assay, for example. So what you see here right away at the day of injection, day zero, there's a lot of virus in the blood, and then it goes down. And that's called a passive viremia because it's not virus replicating. It's just what you have put in. It's the inoculum. Then uh, after a few days, you see a little increase in virus titer. Again, this is virus in the blood. So you see this. And this is called the primary viremia. So this virus has multiplied somewhere in the animal. And that multiplication has led to more, to more virus in the blood. So you can detect that. And then that goes down as well. And then a few days later, there is a secondary increase, much greater. We we'll call this the secondary viremia. And this is because the primary viremia has then seeded other organs in which the virus can replicate. All right, so these are passive primary viremia, secondary viremia. You'll hear these terms a lot in the rest of this course, and that's what they mean. And this is very typical for, for many virus infections. Now, viremia has a number of important consequences. First of all, it allows us to diagnose many virus infections. So you suspect someone of being infected, you take some blood, and you look for a virus. Uh, it can be done with many viruses. Now, if you had respiratory symptoms and it was the flu season, you wouldn't look for influenza in the blood because it's not going to be there. But uh, if you had other infections or you suspected other infections, if you were immunosuppressed, for example, you would take a blood sample and you might reveal the presence of HIV. So it has diagnostic consequences. Second, it has consequences for the blood supply, right? Because if virus is in the blood, we give blood so that other people can have it. We don't have synthetic blood yet. So all our blood that we use for surgeries and injuries and so forth is donor-based. So it has to be screened for all the known viruses that cause viremias. And this includes all the hepatitis viruses and HIV and many, many other uh, viruses that might be there. And over the years, as we have discovered new viruses, we start to screen for them. There was a time when we didn't screen the blood for viruses. We didn't know about them. We didn't know how to screen for them. So we transmitted infections that way. And of course, before we knew about HIV, which is only in the 80s, we transmitted it through the blood supply. So this is a very important consideration. Until someday that we don't need to use donated blood, this will always be an issue. It's really complicated. You have to screen each volume of blood for many, many adventitious agents. So let's, let's put all of this together now, what we've talked about in a scheme of infection. This happens to be a mouse uh, virus infection called mouse pox. So this is a pox virus related to smallpox, which infects people. Uh, but a virologist named Frank Fenner many years ago did a series of pioneering studies of infection of mice with this virus that really set the standards for our understanding of how viruses spread within a host. And here we're going to have infection spread by viremia, primary and secondary viremias, and eventually disease. So in this model, what you do is you take a mouse and you inject it in the foot pad with pox virus. So there, there are fleshy areas in the foot pads of each animal. You put the virus in there, a small amount with a small needle, and then the virus will replicate in the skin where you've inoculated it. So here we have skin invasion and multiplication. The invasion is the injection, of course. It multiplies in the skin. And look, it is reaching then the regional lymph nodes. So the virus has gone below the basement membrane. It's getting into the lymph system, then gets into the blood. You make your primary viremia. So that's the result of virus replicating in the skin. Some of the preferred organs initially of this virus are the spleen and the liver. So the, the virus is taken up into those organs. It grows in them very well. It replicates in spleen and liver cells. And that makes another bolus of virus, which gets into the bloodstream as well. That's called the secondary viremia. So its levels would be much higher than the primary. 
viremia. After the secondary viremia, the virus gets to the skin of the mouse and it then replicates in the skin and you get the characteristic rash disease caused by the virus. Okay? So here's an example where the virus initially replicates in the foot pad, but then spreads to other organs and eventually to, to the skin. So that's an example of virus that goes far from the original site of replication, the primary site, and causes disease somewhere else. And as, as this happens, as this uh, infection proceeds, these are uh, the days uh, after infection, you can see uh, the rash develops as, and the foot swells as well because the virus is replicating there also. So this early period, before there are any symptoms, overt symptom is the incubation period. Here it's about six or seven days, and then we have a period of overt disease. So this is a classic uh, experiment, and you'll see measles uh, infection in people is very similar in, in its development as this. So now we can take a look at uh, a number of virus infections in this general way that we've just laid out, uh, whereas you have a, a primary site of infection, often a uh, respiratory or mucosal surface of some kind, and you can see mucous membranes of the respiratory gastrointestinal tract. Perhaps it's the skin if we can get across the dead layer. Uh, there's a primary site of replication. The viruses can be shed from there and, and infect other people. But in many cases, the virus also gets into the bloodstream. Primary viremia replicating in different organs, leading to a secondary viremia, and then seeding different organs depending on the virus. So varicella zoster virus, mouse pox, targeting the skin, uh, mucous membranes of, of enteroviruses, arenaviruses and hantaviruses, the lungs, others, the kidney, the GI tract, or the CNS. So you see that viremia plays a big role in spreading virus from the original site of infection to the target organs. And this is where the disease is typically uh, manifest. Now many, as you saw in the mouse model, that's mouse pox, virus causes a rash. So many human viral infections also cause rashes. And this is a list of just a couple of them. Uh, an enterovirus, a picornavirus related to polio, measles, parvoviruses, rubella, and varicella zoster. And these are the names of the diseases and the kinds of rashes uh, that are formed. And on the left is a maculopapular rash. Uh, a macular rash is a flat red rash. You can see some of them here. And a papular rash is more rounded, but doesn't have fluid in it typically. So this is a mix. These are mixes of macules and papules, basically. Vesicular rash, you can see, is quite different. These are distinct vesicles which have fluid in them. So there are different kinds of rashes that different viruses make, and, and that's, that's basically what they mean. You can't really diagnose an infection based on the rash, as you can see, because many different viruses cause uh, the same sort of rash. So we've talked about virus spreading in the blood. Virus can also spread in nerves. We call that neural spread. Uh, viruses can get into the nerves at nerve endings, such as uh, endings in muscles or sensory nerve endings, and then they can move uh, up the nerve into the CNS and, and replicate in cells there and cause damage as well. Rabies virus and some herpes viruses, this is how they spread in the animal. Rabies, you are bitten peripherally by a, an animal, a rabid animal. The virus spreads via nerves to your CNS. For some viruses, they actually spread in you in a different way, and this turns out to be an accident. So poliovirus uh, typically is restricted to the blood, but in some situations, it gets into a nerve and travels very efficiently up to the CNS. So it's an accident. Polio, rheoviruses are accidents. So viruses travel in nerves in, in very specific ways. They can either travel by retrograde or anterograde spread. So retrograde means you're taken up at the, um, the termini of the, of the nerve and you move towards the uh, neural cell body. And anterograde, you enter the cell body and go the other way. So in each case, the virus binds to receptors on the nerve. It's taken into the nerve cell. It's transported along the nerve fiber, and that's by the transport pathways that usually operate to bring materials from the periphery to the nerve body. The virus can replicate in the nerve cell itself. That's then released at the synapse and can spread to another uh, nerve fiber as well, and so on and so forth. 
So this allows viruses to spread from very distal peripheral sites to the central nervous system by going across synapses and through uh, nerve fibers. Many viruses do this. And in fact, it's, it's been used to trace uh, nerve circuits in animals. So this is an example of using a herpes virus, which has green fluorescent protein, to trace neural circuits uh, in an animal. You can inject the virus at a very specific place uh, say you go into certain kinds of neurons in the brain or spinal cord, and you can watch to see what other neurons the virus spreads to. You can do this to map the circuitry, all the connected uh, and synaptic connections that occur. So it's a very nice use of the technology. In your nasal cavity, there are also uh, nerve endings, of course. That's how you smell. You have olfactory rods with sensors. Uh, in the top of your nasal cavity right here. And these have a direct pathway to the brain. These have neural connections uh, to the olfactory mucosa uh, and the part of the brain that synapses with this to send in signals to tell you what you are smelling. And this is, an, this is a nice portal. Now, you have to have this in order to be able to smell. So you have this, these openings in, your, in the bone here called the cribiform plate. You have to have it, otherwise you can't smell. And some viruses take advantage of this and they go in there and get into your brain through your nasal cavity. So another example of a neural spread. All right, when we talk about viruses that get into the CNS, there are very specific terms that we use and they're very different. So I wanna tell you what they are. We often talk about a neurotropic virus. So that just means that the virus can infect neural cells. We talk about neurotropic, hepatotropic, enterotropic, any kind of cell or organ, you give it a name, that means the virus can grow there, can replicate there. A neuroinvasive virus means that if you inject the virus into an animal somewhere else, other than in the CNS directly, the virus can get into the CNS. So if I put some virus in my finger and it gets into my brain, it's neuroinvasive. Right? If you inject the virus in the brain, that tells you nothing about neuroinvasiveness. A neurovirulent virus is one that causes disease. So these are all independent terms. Neurovirulent virus doesn't tell you anything about neuroinvasiveness. It does tell you it's neurotropic because the virus has to replicate in neural cells to cause disease. So here are three examples. Herpes simplex virus isn't very good at getting into the CNS. It has low neuroinvasiveness. But if it does get in, it's pretty serious. It causes CNS disease. So we say it has high neurovirulence. Mumps virus is highly neuroinvasive. In fact, when kids used to get mumps all the time before vaccination, uh, about half of them, the virus would end up in their brain, but they were fine because it has low neurovirulence. It's highly neuroinvasive, low neurovirulence. And rabies is the worst combination. It's highly neuroinvasive and highly neurovirulent. Almost 100% fatality if you are bitten by a rabid animal and you don't get vaccinated. You do have time, you have a couple of weeks before the virus, say, gets from your hand to your CNS, because it's very slow moving up there. So that's why you can immunize post-exposure for rabies. But if you're not immunized, I think I know of only two or three people in the world that have survived. Um, I don't know them personally, but I know of them who have survived rabies. Uh, one was a young lady in Wisconsin. They put her in a coma, and so the virus did not do damage. And then after the they treated her with antibodies, and now she's pretty fine. She went to college, and she has a job, and she's one of the few people that survived. So you have to do very heroic things for that. All right, so now we are at the point where we have to get into tissues. We, we can spread either in the blood or by nerve pathways. We have to get in tissues, and this is not easy because there are blocks to things getting into tissues. And there are typically three different ways that tissues are constructed, or I should say the, br the blood tissue interface. We have a virus in the blood, and it has to get into a tissue, because that's where the virus is gonna replicate. Now, in, in uh, the CNS, connective tissues and various muscles, it's very difficult to do that because there's a very nice uh, basement membrane around the blood vessel. This is a capillary, for example. And the blood vessel itself, you know, these capillaries are made from individual endothelial cells. They're very tight. They're very tightly joined. So it's very hard to get through from here to here. So these, these tissues are hard for viruses to get into. Others are easier. 
uh, the, the kidney, the pancreas, ileum, colon, you have a, a nice basement membrane, but the uh, endothelial cells have pores. They're not tightly joined, so viruses can get through those. And finally, you have tissues like the liver, uh, where the, 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 the capillaries are almost non-existent. They're just called sinusoids. They are just passageways through the cells, which are lined very loosely with endothelial cells, or even just macrophages, as the case in the liver. So various degrees of, of the ability to get in. Here's an example from the liver. Uh, these are, uh, this is a passageway through hepatocytes here. And again, you see the cells. This, in this case, these are liver macrophages. They're called Kupfer cells. They're just lying along the walls. And it's very loose coverage. They don't, they don't have tight junctions. So viruses can easily get into the hepatocytes. And so this is hepatitis B virus, which of course infects the liver. It can either get through the, the macrophages or go directly uh, into the hepatocytes. So the liver, of course, is filtering all your blood, and it's a very good place for uh, viruses to replicate. Fortunately, only a certain handful of viruses are able to do this. Now, in the brain, we have a very tight situation. That was the first situation on the left. Tight endothelial cell junctions, tight basement membrane. Nevertheless, viruses can get through. Not many can get into the brain, but but some can do it, and once you're in there, it's, it's not easy to be eliminated. So here's a capillary in the, in the brain. We talk about the blood-brain junction because this is meant to keep things out of the brain, only selective things. You have very tight endothelial cells, a good basement membrane, but viruses can breach this. How do they do it? Well, some viruses actually replicate in the endothelial cells. They bind to receptors, they get through, they cause inflammation, get through the basement membrane. Some are taken up by transcytosis. They bind a receptor, they're taken into a vesicle and deposited on the other side without replicating. And finally, um, again, immune cells, lymphocytes or monocytes, are constantly patrolling your blood supply. These cells are very good at squeezing through uh, the capillaries and they can take viruses with them. So you can have a virus infected lymphocyte, it can squeeze through into the CNS and bring virus with it. <clears throat> So here's a summary of how uh, viruses would get into the CNS based on what we talked about. Remember, viruses can get in by nerve transport. The virus gets into the nerve at a peripheral site in a muscle or a sensory nerve ending, can be brought into the CNS, can be brought in by a capillaries, either in the, uh, the, the cerebrum proper, the parenchyma, or in the meninges. Viruses can get through either kinds of capillaries, or they can also get through uh, blood vessels in the choroid plexus. This is the organ that makes the cerebrospinal fluid. And the blood vessels are more permeable than in the rest of the CNS. So many viruses, in fact, choose to get in. And once you're in the CSF, cerebrospinal fluid, then you can go anywhere uh, in the CNS as well. Okay, so those are the ways you can get into tissues from the blood via nerves. Now the next step is deciding which tissue, in which tissues the viruses are going to replicate, and that's called tissue tropism. So it's the spectrum of, of tissues. We talk about uh, enterotropic viruses, hepatotropic, cardiotropic viruses. That just means the tissue in which they prefer to replicate. Now some viruses are restricted in their tropism. Some are just strictly hepatotropic. They don't grow anywhere else and others are pantropic. They multiply in many organs. And virologists are very interested in understanding what regulates tropism because it may give us a way to control certain virus infections. If you understand why it doesn't replicate in some organs, you may be able to design some kind of, of an intervention. And so these are some of the things that have been revealed over the years as determinants of tropism. Susceptibility, whether you have a receptor for the virus. That's obvious. If a, if a tissue doesn't have a receptor, the virus is not going to infect it. Permissivity, beyond the receptor, what happens inside the cell. For example, transcription proteins may not be present in a cell that a virus requires, so that would limit the tropism. Physical accessibility, some tissues are, are simply not accessible to certain viruses. And then, of course, uh, defenses, both physical defenses and immune defenses. Uh, may be very strong in certain tissues and they can't be breached by the virus or they may, may be very weak. So even if you have all of these conditions met, the immune response may prevent infection. And here's an example of how um, 
tropism is not related to the distribution of virus receptors. These are four different viruses and their tropism and what receptor they use. So for example, rhinoviruses are restricted to the respiratory tract. Their receptor is called ICAM-1, it's found in every cell of our body. So the receptor does not explain tropism, has to be something else. Same thing with flu, it's limited to the respiratory tract in people, its receptor sialic acid is everywhere. Again, there's something else that restricts its distribution. Same for polio virus and herpes simplex virus. Now here's one example of how we think uh, influenza virus tropism is limited. Remember the receptor is present in all organs, so that doesn't explain it. But we think it is at the level of cleavage of the hemagglutinin. Remember the HA, the surface glycoprotein, has to be cleaved to expose the fusion peptide. So this virus can fuse during infection of a cell. What we think happens is when the virus is made in the respiratory epithelium, there are proteases present produced by protease producing cells that cleave the HA as it comes out of the respiratory tract. Those cleaved HA containing viruses can now go on and infect other cells of the respiratory tract. Now, if say one of those viruses got in your circulation somehow and it went to your liver, it could infect a liver cell, but then the viruses produced by the liver cell will, will not have their HA cleaved because this is a protease specific to the respiratory tract. All right, so the protease probably explains the tropism of influenza virus. Okay, now, um, some very virulent influenza viruses don't um, play by this rule. That is, there's a protease in the respiratory tract restricting tropism. Some very virulent avian influenza viruses, H5N1, have um, a sequence of multiple basic amino acids at the HA cleavage site. Now, here's the HA to remind you and here is the cleavage site that would expose the fusion peptide. These viruses have multiple basic amino acids inserted there, so it's different from most other strains. As a consequence, they can be cleaved by proteases that are ubiquitous. They are in every tissue, all right? And so these viruses infect many organs. These proteases, by the way, are located in the late Golgi. You may remember from last time I showed you uh, the, the process of an HA molecule going through the secretory pathway, and I said some of them can be cleaved in the late Golgi by a Golgi resident protease. So those are these uh, ubiquitous proteases, and they cleave the HA within the cell before it gets out. So these can replicate everywhere because the proteases are everywhere. Now, uh, H5N1 are avian influenza viruses that occasionally infect people. They first infected people in 1997 in Hong Kong, and when they were sequenced, they were found to have these multiple basic amino acids inserted at the HA cleavage site. And we believe they may have the ability to replicate in many organs because of this. Certainly in birds, they replicate in, in many organs because of this property. Okay, so we're replicating now. We've figured out how to get to the right place. Let's talk about shedding. We have to shed virus in order to spread the infection from one host to another. It makes no sense to keep a virus in one host because that's a dead end for it. So you have to shed, you have to transmit it. The exceptions, of course, are germline transmission, proviruses that are in the germline. They don't have to be shed. Or if you spread viruses in the blood supply, obviously it's not shed. So that's an artificial situation. Shedding can happen where the virus first replicates, the primary site, respiratory or gut tract, or it can be from a secondary site. Uh, if your virus ends up in your skin and makes a rash, the virus can be there and you can spread it to other people uh, by the rash. So this is how the virus survives, by being transmitted from one person to another, and that's done by shedding. <clears throat> one way is by respiratory secretions. Okay, very common way, you make aerosols. We actually do it by coughing, sneezing, speaking makes aerosols. Uh, and if you're infected, the aerosol has a lot of viruses. You typically, when you sneeze, you expel about 20,000 drops, and they all, they all have viruses in them. And some of these drops are very big, and they fall to the ground right in front of you, a foot or three feet away. So unless you're right in someone's face and you sneeze in their face, you're not going to transmit that way. But others are different sizes, and some of them are very, very small, and they can go between 5 and 160 feet away. They can be sucked into airplane air recirculation systems and infect other people. They're really, really small. These are called droplet nuclei. So that's how viruses get to uh, other people. And again, in the, in the days before measles immunization, if you were all 
uh, seronegative for measles and I had measles, you would all get infected because I'd be putting measles aerosol out uh, to everyone in this room. All right, so you can also contaminate your hands with obviously with viruses. If you have a respiratory infection, you touch your nose, you can contaminate other people. Uh, you can put fingers on your nose and mouth and reintroduce the virus as well. Very common way of, of transmitting. Feces also common in underdeveloped countries, but even here in the U.S., as we will see later, sewage contamination of water, a good way to transmit virus infections. Blood, uh, vector bites, needle sticks, urine, semen, uh, milk is, a, this is a mouse virus that's transmitted among mice by milk. I don't know of any human virus that, that goes that way. And the skin, herpes and pox viruses and papillomavirus. So these are sites of virus shedding. These are where the viruses are replicating. And that's how the viruses are transmitted from one person to another. All right. <clears throat> so how do we transmit now? So we talked about where these viruses are shed. How do you transmit? Transmission is required, of course, to maintain the chain of infection. And I want to basically divide this into two general patterns. One where you have one species infected, like human to human, okay? No intervening vector or alternate infection of insect and vertebrate hosts, okay? So can anyone think of this situation where there's a virus that goes from person to person without a vector? Sorry? What was that? I think it was right, but I couldn't hear it. Rhino, yeah. There's no vector. It goes from person to person. HIV, papillomaviruses, person to person. So with the people are the reservoir for that infection. There's no animal host. There's no insect that's carrying it around. That's this situation. It doesn't have to be people, of course. Animals can spread infections to each other that way as well. Do you know of an example of how a virus infection is spread from person to person by, uh, say, a mosquito? Sorry? West Nile, yellow fever, dengue, tons of them, okay? So that can be, that's this situation, but you probably don't know of virus infections transmitted among animals by such vectors, although there are plenty of them, but it happens in people as well. So those are the two general situations. This ability to be transmitted obviously depends on physical properties of the virus, the physical stability, um, and one of them is actually controlled by whether or not the virus has an envelope. These tend to be uh, fragile and sensitive to low pH. They're often transmitted by aerosols or by injection. But there are exceptions always. There are some envelope viruses that actually go through the intestinal tract. In general, non-envelope viruses tend to be uh, more hardy in the environment. They can withstand drying and detergents, et cetera, extremes. Um, but again, there are exceptions. And these are typically transmitted by respiratory fecal oral roots because they have to go through the intestine or fomites, contaminated materials, uh, bed material or some other material that gets contaminated with virus. So we have, again, some terms for transmission that you should recognize because they'll pop up now and then. Uh, iatrogenic transmission simply means that some, some healthcare worker has infected you, and that happens an awful lot. Hospital-acquired infections are very common. It's better to stay out of hospitals because you typically get infected when you go in them. Nosocomial, you get an infection in a hospital or healthcare facility. Vertical transmission simply means infection from parent to offspring. So during birth or breastfeeding, for example, parent to offspring. And Germline is a, very, is a different form. This is when the virus is integrated into your chromosomal DNA. So the proviral DNA of retroviruses is spread from parents to offspring via the germline. And then horizontal transmission is everything else. If I give you measles, that's horizontal transmission. Yeah, right. <laughs> it's typically birth and breastfeeding. I think if I gave my son a infection, I don't think it would be considered vertical transmission. So it's specifically associated with uh, birth, right? Okay. Now, a couple of other things that are general principles that affect 
infection. So transmission, shedding and transmission is a big uh, determinant, of course. So we'll, we'll explore these in subsequent specific examples. But it turns out that geography and season also influence the incidence of viral infections. So geography, for example, restricts uh, where viruses are. They may need a specific host. So if, you, if a human gets a virus from an animal, maybe the animal isn't present everywhere, so that would restrict the infection. The same with the vector. Um, and this, in fact, was a big deal years ago before global travel. Vi virus infections were quite restricted. Great example, smallpox was in Europe. Measles was in Europe long before people came to the New World. And people in the New World, as far as we know, didn't have measles or smallpox until it was brought there by the colonizers. And it wiped them out because they had never seen it before. Those viruses remained localized because the only vectors or reservoirs are people. And they, people didn't go across the oceans until a certain time. So geography can really restrict uh, the limitation. Now, of course, we travel everywhere pretty much easily nowadays. So there are, very, there, there are less restrictions but they still exist. And one I want to tell you about is chikungunya virus, how the vector can affect the localization of infection. So chikungunya uh, is a toga virus in the alpha virus genus. It's an RNA virus, plus stranded RNA with an envelope glycoproteins. It is spread by this mosquito, Aedes aegypti. So it's a vector transmitted. As far as we know, it's from person to person via vectors. We don't know of any animal reservoir in between, although there might be one. And when you get infected, you get, you get a rash, you get joint pains. In fact, the name comes from uh, the, the symptoms of the infection. Now, this disease was endemic in Africa and parts of Asia for many, many years, never present in the US, never present in Europe. In 2004, uh, an outbreak arose in Kenya, which then spread uh, to India. And at the same time, there was an outbreak on this island called Réunion. It's a French island. And that helped. To, and these are people who travel and vacation in Réunion from Europe. So they brought the virus back to Europe. And so now we have a spread of infection in parts of Europe, Scandinavia, and also Australia and Japan. And many of, much of this spread is a consequence of the virus having a new vector that is bringing it to different places. And the new vector is Aedes albopictus, the so-called Asian tiger mosquito. So previously, this, this vector was a lousy host for the virus, probably didn't replicate well in it. But the virus underwent a one amino acid change in the viral glycoprotein called E1, one of those trimers on the virus surface. And that one amino acid change lets the virus grow in this new mosquito. And because this mosquito had a different range, geographic range than Aedes aegypti, that changed the range uh, of infection. And so here is Aedes albopictus in the US. So this used to not be here in the US. It was brought to the US by used tire trade. Used tires are a big business. They get on container ships. They go all around the world. And used tires always have a little water in them. You can never get rid of it. And mosquitoes breed in these used tires. And that's how this was brought into the US. You can see uh, it's been, I think it was brought into Houston originally. It's now spread over much of the US. Here is 2007. It's about half of the US uh, as well. So we don't have the virus here yet. We don't have chikungunya, but it, it could be spread at some point. If it were brought in, they're obviously the right vector to spread it. Um, seasonality is also an issue in virus infection. Some uh, viruses show seasonality. Here's rubella. It used to be a common childhood infection. Uh, you can see it showed distinct seasonality peaks. These are yearly periods from January to January, the number of cases. Here's influenza, again, uh, number of cases versus time, you can see distinct seasonality. Even polio has a seasonality according to uh, latitude here. Uh, in, north, in, um, in the northern latitudes, it's typically a summer and fall disease. Southern latitudes, it's, well, it's their summer, but our winter. So why is this? We don't understand this very much, but there has been some headway made with uh, influenza. Influenza is seasonally acquired. Up here in the temperate climates, it's uh, in the winter typically. And in this study, which I'm going to tell you about, they use a guinea pig model for transmission. You get two racks of cages next to each other. You put guinea pigs in both. And in one, you infect the guinea pigs. 
and they get infected with flu and they exhale it and cough and then the guinea pigs in the next cage will get it. You put a fan on one side so it blows the virus across and you look at the transmission. So what they did, this was actually done here at Mount Sinai in New York. They tried different conditions of temperature and relative humidity. So they could go from low humidity to high humidity and two different temperatures, five degrees and 20 degrees. So let's look at the five degree. You see at, at low humidity, it transmits really well. This is percent transmission. Then as you raise the humidity, it gets worse. Uh, and it's, it's much worse at 20 degrees. It transmits pretty well even at 20 uh, at low humidity, but as soon as you raise the humidity, it goes down. So these are the conditions that you find in the winter, low humidity and low temperature. So the idea is this favors influenza virus transmission in our climate. That may explain why the virus uh, infection is typically in winter months because it's very dry inside, right? It's dry outside as well, uh, and the temperature is low, and this may favor survival of the virus in the environment. However, just to show you that this, this is never the whole story, this is a graph of flu uh, a few years ago in a couple of different countries, the U.S. and a bunch of tropical countries with tropical weather. Here's the U.S., and you can see it peaks in the winter months. Here's January, the, the, the spring and summer, and then here's the fall and winter again. So in the U.S., the blue peaking of in cases in the, in the winter. But look, um, as we go south, we have peaking here in the middle of, of the year. So these are tropical climates. They don't have low humidity. They have high humidity. They have high temperatures. So we don't really understand uh, what controls seasonality. So there is a distinct seasonality in these tropical climates which cannot be explained by low humidity, for example. And so there must be something else controlling it that we don't understand.